Thank you, Roger. Um, I did manage to slip in a minute or two of personal comments, so I'll reduce my five minutes to three. Um, just to remind us what um, Alistair took us through, the, the, we take it for granted that the, the biobank exists, that the governing council exists, but it really uh, was a very complicated process. And I think the financial independence of the council is extremely uh, important. And the emphasis that you put as well on stewardship as opposed to ownership or custodianship, I think something we need to be reminded of what that means because people do um, sort of a fast track uh, and, and use the word ownership liberally and it's taken literally afterwards by the public. Graham reminded us of the, uh, the nature, the kind of courage that is often needed on the nature of decision making by a governing council, especially on the very tricky social cultural um, questions that arise about representativeness of the public, um, the need for calibration, what he calls reflexivity, and I think is proportionality, um, and finally the um, emphasis on mutuality and engagement with participants, the ongoing communication that goes on between a biobank and its participants, which I must say is much better communication, engagement, and ongoing sort of general feedback than you ever would get in a clinical trial. Um, and then finally, Roger, the role picked up again on the role of critical friend. Um, I especially as a law professor enjoy the brief explanation of reasonableness. Um, this is really important because in the last, or second to last version of the directive slash regulation that is scaring all of us who believe in, in, in um, data as a public resource and samples where properly consented as a public resource as well. This idea that was taken out about re-identifiability, it used to be a reasonable likelihood of re-identifiability as being the uh, margin of interpretation, which of course made things contextual as opposed to black-white decisions. And I thought in one of the last versions that reasonable likelihood had been taken out. And finally, um, um, in the last, uh, in Roger's presentation about being both reactive to the needs of the UK Biobank, but proactive, prospective on issues that need some advanced thinking and guidance. And your last point I, I really liked, because when you say big biobanks, I thought of big data, and we're going to have, begin to see constellations of biobanks working together in federated contexts of, of inter-biobank um, sharing where the statistical significance and the ability to move science forward in a, in a quicker way towards treatments or understanding at least of both resistance um, to disease and health might just require that type of big uh, international kind of biobanking effort. So those are my um, uh, resume of the three and some personal comments on the three presentations. Adrian also asked me to share with you some of the comments um, the delegates were asked to send in um, what you consider to be the main current and upcoming challenges in biobank ethics and governance. So in case some of you out there don't get a chance to get the mic, um, this is what you said. Um, how do we ensure that consent obtained at enrollment continues over time as models of biobanking evolve over time. Um, developing a robust ethics and governance framework that is responsive to current and future needs. Designing consent frameworks that are enduring and therefore suitable for longitudinal. I mean, these longitudinal are, it's hard for people in, in the research, I'm talking research ethics committees, to understand the very nature of longitudinal, that it is material, that it be, and specific, that the consent addresses the specific longitudinal nature and the material elements of longitudinal biobanking. And finally, the last comment on this particular uh, uh, question that went to delegates who are here, um, support the legitimacy of broad consent to multiple and possibly unforeseeable uses of data and materials confronting the fundamental weaknesses of many forms of consent. So those are the um, comments that came in, so the floor is now open for questions. One, two, three. Uh, Adrian, I don't know how many of you there are here. <laughs> okay, you got the order? One, two over there, three over here. Please identify yourself and then I'll make it a question, not a comment. Thank you. 
All right, well, thank you uh, for the very interesting talks. Uh, my name is Brent Middlestad from uh, the Oxford Internet Institute. And I wanted to pick up on the concept of big biobanking, since that's where we ended. Um, are there any ethical challenges or any other sorts of challenges that will make it increasingly difficult to be the critical friend or to have the bottom-up approach to, to governance as we move to big biobanks? Who do you re direct your question to? Um, I suppose to Roger, but okay. perhaps the whole panel would be interested. Sure. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, go close to the mic, please. So, yeah, well, uh, I figured that question was coming here. <laughs> um, Sorry about that, Roger. Yeah, I, 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 while I was just talking to, to the slides, I, I should have mentioned that um, one of the things we would expect to react to would be all the activity in Brussels in relation to the, the draft data protection regulation. And, I mean, if that regulate, let, let's suppose the regulation goes through in a way that um, is the worst possible, we think the worst possible scenario for a big biobank that's, that, that's predicated on a broad consent. Um, and uh, what would happen then? Uh, would this be the end of bottom-up governance? I mean, my, my, my guess is, um, I know Mike might correct me on this, my guess is that if it went through like that, the first thing would be a conversation with Jonathan Sellers, who is the company secretary and a legal advisor to, to biobank. I mean, they take legal advice, I think, on whether the regulation really means what, 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 what many commentators think it does mean, or is there a way of, you know, of, of continuing with Biobank without reconsenting participants and writing fresh consents? I mean, what, what exactly does this imply? And um, whilst the EGC could play a part in these discussions, and I hope it would, um, everybody would be hands-on to try and find the most constructive way to deal with what you know, really looks like a major roadblock for, for big Biobanking. So, yeah, I mean, on the near horizon, there there is a major regulatory issue for for biobanks that, well, whether you call them big or not, that at least have taken broad consents, uh, that consents that don't look as though they're perhaps specific and explicit in the way that the the draft regulation might 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 seem to require. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, that would be my. I think Graham, and then we'll go to the next one, Graham. Can I just offer a comment? So, I think one of the, the core challenges around privacy is. Reinforcing the message that privacy nowhere is a guarantee. It's about risk management and minimization. And some of those risks might be included if you're if, or extended if you are extending the reach of a, a particular biobank to other biobanks, et cetera. So the reach of an ethics and governance council, therefore, might become attenuated. So there, I think there's challenges around that. What I don't think we can do is imagine that there can be a one-size-fits-all approach to these sorts of collaborations. I think it, it needs to be more about mutual recognition of what are our ethically robust mechanisms in other jurisdictions or in, in, in other contexts. It's about ensuring that there are mechanisms or frameworks for assessing the interoperability of privacy protection mechanisms so that we, as for example, in EGC, could trust that data that were being transferred to another environment or, or being shared with another environment there's not only interoperability, but also sufficient protections there, but it would actually have to be in an aspect of trust. So I think one of the, the core ethical issues is that the governance mechanisms find ways to trust each other as these, these initiatives become bigger. Thank you. A second question, I think. Um, just... My name is David Walker. I'm a, a relatively new member of the EGC. And it's a question picking up from what Graham's just said. It's the, the width of the EGC's sort of role, particularly in sensitizing UK Biobank to contextual developments. You mentioned all the hay. During the life course of the EGC, major changes in the data environment. We've just heard big data mentioned. Uh, care dot data clearly was a major issue in terms of public attitudes towards the use of collection, <coughs> exploitation of their data by public agencies and researchers. How far, question, should the EGC be a transmission mechanism to ensure that researchers are aware of these change, the changing contours, including, if I may say, ideological and political contours. On the uh, platform, there are two Scotsmen. In recent months, we've had a major event which could have sundered the United Kingdom and affected the very basis on which uh, UK Biobank works. Again, question how far the EGC might have a role in ensuring that researchers, who sometimes uh, work in rather hermetic <coughs> circumstances, are aware of large changes. And just briefly, if I may, an observation. I used to be a member of the uh, Economic and Social Research Council. 
Um, during my tenure there, we engaged in at least two major new programs involving biological sampling, other time in society, and now the life study. In neither of those were we aware of the work that the EGC was doing. So uh, an observation is maybe the EGC hasn't blown its trumpet sufficiently loudly to alert others to the remarkable experience it's been garnering in its relationship with ongoing research that might, in parallel, and obviously different circumstances, be applied elsewhere. Alistair, can you address that one, please? Is this because I'm a Scotsman? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah I, I, I think that the, the idea of more outward-facing aspect, which was men mentioned um, as you know, part of uh, how uh, Graham and and also Roger are seeing the EGC. I think that's become uh, more and more important. Um, if I think of the very beginnings of the EGC when I was chair for the first two years, we were quite rightly focused very much on how Biobank was going to go about recruiting all the various issues to do with this. Huge amount of time was taken up with that. The, the, uh, the Biobank is past that stage now to a stage of uh, maturity in which there is research going on. And I agree with you that I think that um, being aware of the environment uh, in which the, uh, the Biobank operates is going to be critically important. I mean, the European matter was mentioned by Roger, and that is terribly uh, worrying because I think if some very um, narrow view is taken of the protection of privacy, it is going to be um, really a very bad news for the collections like UK Biobank. But more, more generally, I think we need to understand, continue to understand public attitudes to these issues. Uh, it is interesting that young people um, seem not to be so worried about privacy. Um, so Facebook and, and all of that stuff, what people will put online these days, may, maybe in a sense the whole social context is shifting and that actually the idea of risk to privacy, if that's the only risk, may not uh, weigh so heavily. But the legislation could go the other way. Uh, one comment on researcher uh, appreciation and or knowledge of, a, of already existing governance models or guidelines. I think that is, even if it's to extrapolate um, to areas that aren't longitudinal or biobanking or resource oriented, that is a big, a big issue. I think um, um, it's sort of a, a wasted treasure or hidden treasure, I should say, um, that definitely needs um, to be addressed within the limited budget of the, of the council. The other is, remember, if that directive slash regulation goes through with its um, specific explicit consent and a high public interest and all the other caveats that are in there, you have to read the whole thing, um, it's going to have an effect on outside of Europe because they can only transmit data to countries that have equivalent protections. So it's not, so it worries everyone uh, just when we're beginning to learn how to share and collaborate and network and do big science with big data, uh, end, end of story right there. Um, next question. Alexandra, right over here. Uh, hello, thank you for your talks. My name is Alexandra Obadia. I am CEO of Cartagene, which is uh, one of the cohorts of the Canadian consortium Bertha was talking about. So here's my question. Um, do you have a process in place in case of violation of the EGC framework that was adopted by the Biobank? Because I understand the EGC is a critical friend, but sometimes you will need a parent. So who plays that role? <laughs> Good one. That's a lawyer, by the way. Let's go. Okay, who, who wants to take that one? You mean, you mean if there were a violation of the EGF? Yes. Who do people report to? Well, this is the point. Of view. We, well, I, I, I mean... The, the, <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> if, we, if we thought Biobank weren't listening... Then we'd, we'd go to the funders, uh, and I think the, the, 
The EGF actually does have provisions in, I think. As well. So the EGF in the situation that Alexander was describing of a, of a breach that was not properly addressed by the UK Biobank, if I understand the question, then the uh, Governing Council could take it to the funders. That's right. Thank you. Yes, the, I mean, the nuclear option was mentioned. I mean, I think you're, you, know, you haven't got to the nuclear option yet. That, that would be where this then becomes public and actually you lose the enrollment, people yeah. drop. Yeah. Yeah. So there are a whole set of steps that could be taken in the event that it would appear that UK Biobank is simply not listening and is actually breaching something but they're committed to. That's good because I think more than the sanction, the loss of public trust would be fatal. Uh, yeah, no, I, I'm confident that's right. I, I just think we never know what the future holds, and yeah. you know, and so a whole change of personnel might result in something different. Mm -hmm. We have some guarantees here in the front, um, um, Martin. Um, so I'm Martin Bobro. I, you know, a, a long time ago, I was a very minor part of a decision-making process that led to the creation of this structure. And I'm sitting, and, and I was an enthusiastic supporter both of Biobank and of the creation of an EGC. At the time, I thought it was an act of instinct rather than rationality. It was a real punt uh, as to how this would work out. And I'm sitting here 10 years later wondering whether we got it right. Uh, I don't doubt that the successive EGCs have done an excellent job. The question that nobody has addressed is whether this is really a generalizable model that should be widely adopted by others, or whether there were ways that it could have been set up that would have done a better job, or a cheaper job, or a more efficient job. Um, mm -hmm. Was it the right structure to, to start with? All right, who wants to answer that one? You've got a minute to explain. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a minute. Can I start by sure, saying, go ahead, um, I, I, of course, um, I work in Asia. I've, I've been in Asia now for about eight years. And uh, there's a huge interest in biobanking across many countries. There are several Asian representatives here from different um, bodies there. I, Martin, I feel that the, the model is the right one, and I'm a, a kind of evangelist for it when I'm, I'm giving talks on biobanking. Because I think if you go for something like an internal ethics committee, it's just not going to do the job. If, on the other hand, you over-regulate and try to control it by means of some piece of legislation, you don't have the subtlety that is actually required. So I, I would defend this as a successful experiment, but of course I'm biased, but I, I believe it is. We'll give our other two presenters a... <laughs> for, for the nature of the enterprise, because a biobank, as you know, is loosely used to cover all kinds of private disease collections or leftover from clinical trials or whatever, we're talking here about longitudinal UK biobank resource. Roger. Oh, oh well, I, I mean, Graham's, I think, asked the question, uh, what, what added value really is there in the EGC? I, I mean, and I think it's true that there is a, an element of belt and braces here. That the belts are already there in, in the wrecks and, and whatnot, uh, and we're the braces. Uh, but I don't think that given the nature of um, this kind of research and the unfortunate start that was made in Iceland with, with I think, you know, Geek Co, that, that, that this was a bad move at all. And uh, I mean, I think now for the, for the funders to, well, well certainly for the funders to, to sort of U turn on this would, would look very odd. But you're right, I think, that the, the question of whether this is a generalizable model to export elsewhere, I, I don't know. I, th I think that's part of the conversation I certainly would like to have with, with, with a colleague around the world and say, look, this is the way we've done it here. Um, is this a model that might work for you? And, but but there's, no, there's no sense that we're trying to sell this to the rest of the world. Okay. Graham, and then we have one very short question. Go ahead. Very briefly, I think that this model, Martin, has... Um, started potentially a paradigm shift in the way in which we look at in parallel development of protocols and governance. It's a mutual learning experience that continues over the time. We don't imagine that we have to have everything right sort of and dealt with upfront 
and actually we embrace that rather than fear it. And I think that in that sense, something like a model like this actually is transposable at a sufficient level of abstraction, understanding that that's what it's actually delivering and will continue to deliver because it's about that mutual learning. Thank you. And uh, Bill, you have the last word here. Quick comment. I think um, I admire all that's gone on in the 10 years with a few minor exceptions. Uh, I would say that UK bio, that the Ethics and Governance Council needs to learn to say, no, we can't do everything. I suspect that I've always said that I thought that UK Biobank itself should have strong ethics and other advisory uh, input as well as technical input, which it has. And I imagine that the committee that Professor Barbro chairs, the expert advisory uh, panel, a committee on uh, data access, may be a step in that direction. And I would, maybe we'll have to do it over lunch, Martin, but I wonder, my, I imagine by asking your question, you have some things in your mind that things that could have been done better or there have been alternatives that should have been considered. So I hope you'll share those with us as the time goes on. Yes, we have uh, another tomorrow and the rest of the day to continue discussing and asking questions. I'd like you to join me in thanking our panel for this morning's presentations. Thank you.